So I want to welcome everybody tonight um, to the Human Trafficking Awareness uh, Overview. Um, in uh, We're doing this in accordance with the January as Human Trafficking Awareness Month. And uh, so tonight we will be, Hope for Justice will be doing this uh, in conjunction with Advocating Opportunity, which is um, a newer NGO to the Nashville market, but not new to the human trafficking arena. And uh, we will be doing this presentation with them and with an opportunity for them to discuss some of the great services that they provide to human trafficking victims. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen uh, with you guys. And we'll go ahead and start from here. Just so everybody knows, this is this presentation is being recorded. It is not going to be broadcast on the World Wide Web, but for those who were unable to attend this event, who registered for it um, and ask if they could get a copy to review, we will be providing that to them. So I just want to make sure, Kelly, can you see that good? I cannot yet. Cannot, okay. I'm just seeing all the participants. Let me make sure it's not my view. Okay. No, I don't see your screen yet. Oh, it's starting now. Okay. There it is. All right. So those of you who are not familiar with, with Hope for Justice and our educational opportunities that we bring out the awareness uh, on human trafficking uh, tonight, we're doing this in conjunction, as I said, with advocating opportunity. Uh, a little bit about Hope for Justice for those of you who, who may not be familiar with what we do. Uh, you know, we exist to end modern slavery through prevention, uh, rescue, restore, and reform. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with the fact that we have investigative hubs across uh, the globe. Uh, we're located on five continents uh, with roughly 35 offices across uh, the world uh, in order to, to bring our mission. These are some of the offices that we have uh, hey. continents and, and where we are. And then I'd like to, to welcome Cheyenne and Megan to talk a little bit about advocating opportunity and, and what uh, services they bring. You're here uh, early. What's going on, girl? Nothing good. <laughs> I think somebody's got a, a hot mic. We might have to, have to pause your mic. Yeah, I can't mute them. I don't know she if you muted it, Rich. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Cheyenne Riddle with Advocating Opportunity, specifically with the Nashville office. We've also got Megan Matamo here. She's our executive director. Advocating Opportunity uh, started in Ohio and is based in Ohio, and that's where she is located. Megan, if you want to introduce yourself. Yes. Hi, I'm Megan Matamo. I'm the uh, founder and executive director of Advocating Opportunity. Um, we started in Ohio, in Toledo in 2000, oof, 2012, um, underneath a, another nonprofit that we worked at called Toledo Area Ministries. Um, and then we grew from there and started our own uh, independent nonprofit. Cheyenne worked with us in law school and was just like an incredible intern and really passionate about the cause and really dedicated to her work. And so when she passed the bar, she wanted to start an office in Nashville and she's been slowly building that for the last few years and we're ready to launch with our new client advocate, Roxy, who I think might be here as well. So we're excited to talk to you a little bit about what we do. So as it you know, as, as a representative with Hope for Justice, I'm, I'm super excited for this opportunity for us uh, to engage with advocating opportunity and the services that they provide to, to trafficking victims. So much in the nonprofit world, we really need to focus on collaborative efforts uh, as a way for us to, to work to represent victims, uh, victim advocacy and representing them and rescuing them and identifying and educating everyone. And that's what we hope to do tonight is educate you guys tonight on some of the things, talk about a few case studies that are out there, but then also discuss um, what you can do, what part you can play uh, in this. So when we talk about human trafficking, there's so many myths and misconceptions that revolve around human trafficking. But when we look at it holistically from the, the law perspective, we look at the statute 
is really force fraud or coercion, compelling someone to engage in sex or labor or domestic servitude through the use of force, fraud, and coercion. And so later in this presentation, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what actually force, fraud, and coercion is uh, and, and, and how those can be interpreted in, in the court because a lot of people have that misconception that human trafficking is uh, like the movie Taken. And uh, so uh, the hardest part, one of the... Uh, individuals that I work with as a prosecutor in human trafficking. And she always tells me she was rich. The hardest part for me is to convince a jury and a judge that this is human trafficking. Um, this meets the elements of human trafficking. But all they can envision is Liam Nielsen uh, trying to free his daughter who was kidnapped. And yes, it's, that's human trafficking as well. But there are also many forms, which we will talk about tonight as we go through here. So buying, selling, or trading of human beings for labor and or sex. And often sometimes we um, pigeonhole our thoughts with blinders on thinking that just human trafficking revolves around sex, but there's many other victims out there that go unidentified, whether it is through labor trafficking or domestic servitude. These victims are exploited for sex and labor. Um, traffickers use a lot of different techniques. And oftentimes people will say to me, you know, well, this individual is hooked on drugs. And we often say that drugs are used as a mechanism to control this individual. And, you know, one of the the, the common factors that revolve around or the common denominator that revolves around trafficking victims is their vulnerability. And that vulnerability is exploited by traffickers. So some of the facts when we look at this that kind of just kind of hit home so everybody kind of understands the magnitude of human trafficking. 25 million people in the world are victims of human trafficking. Five million of those are forced into sexual exploitation. Four million children are exploited. And the reason is it's 150 billion with a B, billion dollar a year business. So when we think about this, why is human trafficking one of the fastest growing crimes in the world? Because you can only sell that drug once, but you can sell that boy, that girl, that man, that woman over and over and over again. They are a reusable commodity. So I always like to throw this up just so people can kind of see where they are in the United States and where human trafficking is prevalent. And just because there's a state on here with it doesn't have a number, it doesn't mean human trafficking doesn't exist there. Um, this is just the top 25 states uh, that uh, reported the highest number of human trafficking cases uh, throughout the United States. Um, and as you can see, we've kind of broken it down into kind of three corridors so, uh, to kind of look at um, how heavy the concentration is in certain areas. So <clears throat> when we continue to look at the facts, we know that roughly 75% of trafficking victims are female. And underage females make up a large percentage of that, 20%. Um, one of the concerning factors to us when we look at what feeds this funnel to trafficking is we know that most vulnerable populations and certainly runaways are uh, at high risk to be trafficked. Uh, we know that roughly, you know, there's around 2 million runaways in the United States and females represent a majority, well, 60% of that factor, right? Well, 36% of runaways are traded uh, sex for a place to stay. They resort to what we refer to as what we call survival sex. So they're out on the street, they have no money, no clothing, uh, no food, no shelter. So they resort to survival sex. A lot of the pathway revolves where these individuals will then get hooked on narcotics or on drugs, and then that drug is used as a mechanism to control them. So we also know that up, an upward of 40% of homeless young adults have been trafficked. Hi, I'm Kelly Clunan, and um, I'm excited to be here with you guys tonight. And I have worked with Hope for Justice for about a year and a half now volunteering, I think, Rich. And um, I am a healthcare provider. I'm a nurse. I teach at a nursing school. And I have really worked with Hope for Justice. And we've worked together to develop healthcare training modules to basically find industries that intersect with human trafficking victims. 
And so one of the things that really struck me was this very first fact listed here, just as a healthcare provider, seeing that almost 90% of survivors had been in contact with the healthcare provider at some point during their victimization. So essentially nine out of 10 of the victims of human trafficking are seen by a healthcare provider. Uh, we know about almost 70% of those are in the emergency department, but it's all over the board with everything else. It's you know outpatient clinics, uh, dentists, uh, psychology, things like that, but mostly uh, in the emergency department or those types of kind of quicker clinics in and out type things. Um, so I just think that's amazing and something that we do another training on if anyone is ever interested, if any of you guys are healthcare providers, we give a little bit more information of how to help screen those victims and, and things like that. Um, but most juvenile victims have been through the juvenile court system. Traditionally, they have been viewed as teen prostitutes. Um, and treated accordingly by law enforcement, just as Rich mentioned at the beginning. 100,000 to 300,000 are the number of prostituted children in the United States. 100,000 to 300,000 children. Uh, victims are typically teenagers, as Rich mentioned, with an average age of a girl between 12 and 14 and an average age of a boy is a little bit younger at 11 to 13 years old. So human trafficking cases have been up um, since COVID, about 185%. This statistic is just insane to me. I always say, if you know a kid, know someone who has a kid, love a kid in your life, um, please hear this next minute. Uh, one in five kids are sexually propositioned online through different games or social media platforms. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reported that 90%, there was a 90% increase of reports that received of online enticement. So, and, and one of the things that's important to know is that these traffickers, they just send a message out to like hundreds, thousands of kids on, online, right? Like same message. And they're just trying to kind of get someone to message back. Okay, so it's real easy for them. Uh, and this is through, you could see all these different sites there. So it's, you know, the common ones, you know, of Facebook, Instagram, but there's games, there's, um, unfortunately, Rich has let me know there's one that was through a Bible app that has happened before. There's all kinds. So any of the online opportunities for chat, anything that has that is a possible potential breeding ground for this. For human trafficking. So when when we look at the various forms of human trafficking, you know, earlier we discussed that a lot of people think it's only related to the sex industry, but that's that's just a misconception and it's not true. Uh, forced labor is, is certainly a concern of ours um, and domestic servitude, and we'll talk about both of those as well, but often those go <clears throat> not only unrecognized, but uh, typically not prosecuted. Uh, domestic servitude, uh, particularly, um, is, is very clandestine. A lot of these crimes are clandestine in nature and hidden, uh, so it makes it hard to, to identify. But <clears throat> one of the other things, too, is the fact that how media kind of shapes the thinking on human trafficking. And, and as I brought up earlier, a lot of people think it's, uh, you know, Liam Nielsen in the movie Taken or, or something that's Hollywood-esque, but and a lot of times you'll see the media uh, confuse trafficking and smuggling, and they're certainly two different. Uh, crimes, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about those too as we go through here, but I just kind of want to display some of the myths as, as we kind of go through uh, this part. Human trafficking involves the transportation of a victim from one place to another. That's a myth. Transportation is not required at all. A lot of times people are trafficked in the same neighborhood that they grew up in. Uh, we had rescued a, a young female at a hotel, and I asked if she was uh, from the Nashville area or if she was from another city, and she was like, no, I grew up right down the street from here. Uh, so transportation is not an element uh, of, of, of human trafficking whatsoever. Um, a lot of times people think that it only happens to foreigners or people who are brought in. Uh, yes, indeed, that does happen, but it's, it, it's typically uh, not the case. Uh, you don't need transportation for somebody to be a victim of, of human trafficking. So myth or fact, the majority of human trafficking victims are women and girls. That is a fact. Women and children, as we've mentioned, they're disproportionately affected with modern slavery. It's slavery. It's, it accounts for about 71% of victims. So it's much more about three quarters are women and girls. Uh, so this one, any minor engaged in commercial sex is a victim of human trafficking. That is a fact. No child can say that they want to be a prostitute or um, sell themselves that is never 
allowed. Okay, so any minor engaged in commercial sex is a victim of human trafficking. That is true. So if they're under the age of 18, they cannot give consent. If they're found to be involved in commercial sex, they are automatically a victim. And that is per U.S. law. A lot of times people feel like it, because the victim might be getting paid uh, that they're not a victim of human trafficking, but that's not true. Um, there are several cases when we look particularly um, at labor trafficking, labor trafficking cases where individuals might be getting paid um, a certain amount uh, for what they're doing, but they're not getting paid what they deserve. And if the minimum wage is $15, and the, for example, and the individual is getting paid $8, it might be $8 more than what they were making in their host country or here in the U.S., but they're being exploited and being paid under under the wage rate. So just because they are getting paid or they may get gifts or et cetera, they're still a victim of human trafficking. Keep in mind the, the law of, of force, fraud, or coercion, okay, in, in regards to that. Um, smuggling, often confused with trafficking. And a lot of times people think these two go hand in hand. That's not the case. Smuggling people across the U.S. border uh, from Mexico into the U.S. is a form of human trafficking, not true. Now, we do know that smuggling can lead to trafficking. One of the trends that we're starting to see right now is a large number of, of um, immigrants coming into the United States that might be coming in undocumented. They might be paying someone for them to come into the country. And we're, we'll talk about push and pull factors here during this presentation. But when we talk about somebody coming into the United States for a better opportunity, uh, fleeing violence, fleeing gangs or drugs or whatever, uh, to come here to, to the U.S., and then they get here, they're under debt bondage. They may have paid a smuggler five to $10,000 to get them into the United States. And now that they're here, then they can be exploited for labor or sex to pay off that debt. So smuggling can lead to trafficking, but they're entirely two different things. So when we look at these two and we put them side by side and we kind of look at like, what's the difference? And one of the key differences that I always tell people is, you know, smuggling is voluntary. It's voluntary in nature. People will often ask you or pay you to smuggle them, to get them out of the situation they're in, just to give them a better opportunity here in the U.S. or whatever country they're going to, right? Smuggling is voluntary, but no one has ever raised their hand and said, would you please exploit me for sex or labor? No one has ever raised their hand and asked to be trafficked. The key in there is voluntary, okay? So when we start talking about some of the push and pull factors, these are important because these factors really elevate the risk factors of someone becoming trafficked. So we're not saying that everyone who's in poverty is gonna be trafficked. That's just simply not the case. Everyone who's a substance abuse user is gonna be trafficked. That's just not the case. These are all ingredients. And when you keep compiling these ingredients, you, know, you have a product at the end and typically that product is a high risk victim to be trafficked. So poverty, we're in 2022, poverty shouldn't even exist. At, at this juncture in our lives, but unfortunately it still does, right? Grooming, we're starting to see a heightened level of grooming, particularly online now, more so than ever before. And we'll talk about that in here and some of the signs to look for. Substance abuse, we know that substance abuse is, is a means for someone to be controlled. Um, I had interviewed a, a young lady one time and I asked her um, if, uh, I said, Annie, I said, have you always used heroin? And she says, no, uh, Rich, I, you know, I, I never used heroin before I was in this situation. But one of the girls that was being trafficked with me and forced into prostitution gave me some heroin one day and she told me to take it. It would help me get through the day. And she goes, all I wanted was for my day to be over. So I took it. And she says, and it helped me cope. It was a coping mechanism. It got me through my day. Little did I know that I would become addicted to it. So not only was she dependent upon her trafficker for food, clothing, and shelter, she became dependent upon her trafficker um, chemically because she needed that substance. She became an addict. And that was the first time she used it after she was exploited. Instability in their homes, instability in their lives, abusive and neglected homes, runaways, homeless, foster kids. So when we talk about the push and pull factors, we have to start thinking about how many of these factors combined or isolated can contribute to raising the risk of somebody feeding the trafficking funnel? Um, you know, <clears throat> oftentimes people talk about abductions and, and, you know, I see these 
uh, conspiracy theories online all the time where I see somebody says, take a picture of a cart at, at uh, Target and there's a zip tie on it. And they're like, this is a sign of somebody becoming trafficked. If you see a cart with a zip tie on it, that means that they were targeting this person who was using this to abduct them. That's simply not the case. Okay. Don't get your news from social media. You know, abductions are rare. Okay. Extremely rare. Do people get kidnapped and trafficked? Yeah, sure. That happens. Okay. There's no absolute, but yes, that happens, but it's the rarest form of the funnel that feeds people into human trafficking. Online grooming is on the rise. It is, uh, I'll talk to you guys about a case that I just worked just a few weeks ago in regards to, to online grooming. Um, the internet, social media platforms, and the use of the internet by um, the age that is most vulnerable to become trafficked um, has increased exponentially, okay? Um, traffickers pose advertising for modeling jobs online all the time. These sites actually look pretty legitimate. If you go to them and you research them and you look at them and they'll seek out these young individuals online, both male and female, and they'll look for those and they'll find the ones who are borderline insecure. Um, they'll profile them and they'll groom them into saying, you're so pretty, you should be a model, check out my website, check out these pictures. So they're false ads. Some of them are telling them they can provide them a better life, you know, better education, employment, okay, um, or work, you know, and, and we talked earlier about seeking the help of smugglers to get somebody. This is a common pathway, you know, they get into the United States, they're already in debt bondage, and now they have to work this off. Uh, some come from dysfunctional families and domestic violence. They don't know any different in life. And whatever life they have is better than the one they had at home. So they're willing to escape a living hell only to become something that's the same as that. Runaway and homeless, we talked about that, those with emotional and psychological difficulties, and certainly those who have, um, you know, uh, a history of drug or, or alcohol abuse. But one of the things we have to understand is that, you know, traffickers don't really discriminate based on gender, race, or demographics, immigration, whatever. They don't care about that. There's no exact one mold. Nobody's walking around with a t-shirt on that says, I'm a trafficking victim. OK, or please exploit me. And the same thing with traffickers. They're not walking around. It's extremely clandestine, uh, this crime in nature. It's not just going to stand out at you. So where is it in the U.S. when we talk about where is human trafficking? Where is it at? Um, you know, a lot of people are naive to the fact to say oh, it's not here. It's not in my not my neighborhood. It's not my city. It's not my county. It's everywhere. No one's immune to it. No one's not a part of this fraternity or sorority. Everyone is a part of this. It's all over the place. You may not see it. You may not recognize it, okay? But when we talk about where is it being advertised, where, is, where can you find it here in the U.S. escort services? We'll go through this. I'm going to show you some websites that I just downloaded today. The internet, hotels, motels, massage parlors, brothels, Airbnb. And I put Airbnb on there is basically because one of the trends that we're starting to see is these traffickers are actually renting out Airbnbs. They're bringing in girls. They're prostituting them out at this Airbnb for that night. And then they're gone the next day, leaving little or no trail. So instead of using a hotel where they have witnesses and people can see them, they're simply getting an isolated Airbnb and running them through there, making it even more difficult, not only for law enforcement, but for, for anybody else to track them. So when we looked at how this was originally kind of set up, you know, traffickers used what we call Backpage. And Backpage is much like Craigslist. It was a site that you could go to and you could search for anything you wanted to. You could search for a chair, a coffee table, somebody to mow your lawn, somebody to clean your pool or sexual services. So the U.S. government, uh, decided to shut down Backpage. And this is the actual site where they shut it down and, uh, and seized it. But remember, it's a $150 billion a year business. So it didn't slow it down any. They just decided they would open up what they call ebackpage.com. And now it's open and you can do the same type of things there on the internet, which leads to the, the, the issue is like, you know, it's obviously not law enforcement's problem is the fact that how do you police the internet? How do you have the resources to, to, to dig this deep and to do it? Another one that we're starting to see a huge problem with is the illicit massage parlor business. And when we look at this, we know that there's an upwards of 25,000 illicit massage parlor businesses across the U.S., right? And you can go to this 
the site, WW Body Rubs Map, and, and locate um, what sites are there. And as you can see in the bottom uh, corner, bottom right hand corner, I actually just did this today, uh, this afternoon. Uh, you know, the site's still up, it's still operational, um, it's still there. So let's just walk you through how easy it is for us to find commercial sex, uh, you know, in, in the US. So right here, I just pull up Texas, I look through a certain city, type it in. Um, as you can see, these are multiple sites, uh, multiple links that you can click on. Um, these are supposedly massage uh, businesses. Um, as you can see, some of the jargon that's being used in this is not <clears throat> um, indicative of a massage parlor services or legitimate ones anyway. And you click one on and then boom, it takes you here uh, to this site and it shows you your individuals that are, are available in the cost. And, you know, it doesn't take any super secret spy tools to figure this out. You can put it into the super secret, super secret search engine called Google, and you can see that this goes to a massage parlor, okay? And, you know, this massage parlor is advertising for sex. So how do we police this? How do we stop this? Uh, you know, because these do exist. They're out there. They're in every city. I'm not saying every massage parlor is a is an illicit sex or commercial sex spot. I'm not saying that. I am saying that we do know that there's an upward of 25,000 illegal massage parlors across the U.S. That's what we do know. So aside from sex, what, what do we have? You know, we look at labor exploitation. One of the, the, the lowest prosecuted uh, trafficking violations there is, uh, hardly ever identified, um, and, and certainly not uh, prosecuted to the fullest, um, very difficult to prove, um, domestic work, such as housekeepers. So some of you might have heard me and Kelly speak before. I'll tell you a story about a, a lady of uh, an investigation that we had worked here at Hope for Justice as an individual who came to the United States to become a nanny from another country. And when she did, she came here, she had a language barrier, which is kind of one of the factors that, that could contribute to um, her being trafficked. She wasn't aware of the laws uh, in the United States very well. She wasn't uh, aware of what services that could have been provided to her. And she worked for this family as a nanny um, for 37 years. Um, they took her passport. Um, she slept on the floor in the garage. She uh, only got to eat the scraps or what was left over from dinner. And I don't mean what was left over that they didn't eat. I meant was what was left over on their plate that they didn't eat. And we had got contacted by a nurse um, who had received our human trafficking awareness training and had talked to us about this uh, uh, individual. And we worked this investigation to find out that um, this lady had been in the United States for 37 years. She was 78 years of age. Um, she didn't even know how old she was. I don't know how you give someone that many years of her life back. Uh, we worked with, with federal law enforcement to, to rescue her and put her in to an assisted living. Um, but, you know, how do you give that person those number of years? And I always tell people the, the hardest thing when people say like, what's, what's the, if there was one case that really hit you hard, one case that really bothered you and concerned you, what, what would that case be? And it certainly would have to be this case because after we followed up with her and interviewed with her, the hardest part for her to understand was why she wasn't getting to go back to that house after all this was over, because that's all she ever knew. That's all she ever knew for 37 years was cooking and cleaning and taking care of those people. And that's where she thought she was going to die. And she didn't know any difference. And that was difficult for me and having seen a lot of things in my career, uh, you know, to, to for me to even deal with. Um, and, you know, now she's safe. So, you know, great for her, but how do you, how do you rewind the world and give her back those precious years that she lost that somebody exploited her? Um, you know, labor trafficking is certainly prevalent. And when we talk about what are some of the signs of labor trafficking, we, we have to look at uh, some of these and, and think about it, avoid eye contact with employers and, and outsiders. And I'd interviewed a, an individual one time and I asked him, I said, what, you know, even when I was talking to him, I was like, why, why aren't you looking at me when you're, when I'm talking to you, why do you keep looking away? And he's like, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of the 
position I put myself in. I'm ashamed of where I am. And, and, and I'm also fearful that my employer will look at me and uh, see. So I've just made a habit of never making eye contact with people. So they always appear fearful for, for what's going to happen to them. They're not in control of their own documents, most certainly. Um, there's always untreated injuries, malnourishment, fatigue, a lack of hygiene. And, and you know, and, and Kelly, let me throw that in to you real quick when we talk about this. So from a practitioner setting and a clinical setting, you know, what do you guys look for um, from from personal signals on it, physical signals on people when they come into to the hospital? Well, I, th I think you hit some of them. I mean, when you see people in dirty clothes or under their fingernails, like you kind of look for just lack of bathing, dirty clothes, smelling, all those things, as you said. Um, but a big thing is definitely, um, you know, injuries or health conditions that are just prolonged. So ones that like, you know, you, you would typically go in and get treated for that quickly, but you find that they didn't get treatment for months until it's really progressed to something more serious. Um, sometimes you'll see just like an abuse situation, you'll see, uh, you know, old bruising, burns. Um, on x-rays, you might find some healed fractures that, you know, were just never reported. So all those kind of things, you know, are part of it that just something's not right because a typical person would take you know, themselves to the doctor to solve that problem and not live in that kind of pain. So, but I think the looking away too is a big thing and the no documentation, not holding on to it, someone being there with them. And even back to your story, you just told, I don't, did you mention she was from the Philippines? I don't know if you said that today, but yeah. um, she was from the Philippines. And a big thing with that story that really hits me as a, a clinician is that you, um, the reason that she had been to the hospital, how many times, which time was that rich? That was like her over three to four times, times. three or four it. times. But the nurse that ended up identifying, first of all, she did have the hope for justice training, but she also spoke the dialect of, I think it was Tagalog, I, I believe. And so she spoke that and, you know, a big thing in the hospital is sometimes we cut corners, especially in a busy emergency department, especially right now with COVID rampant. Um, you know, I could see where those corners could get cut and just use a family member or a friend as the interpreter. But that is probably, if you walk away with one thing as any type of practitioner, please always get a trained interpreter, whether it's a, through the phone or they have video ones now or a person in the hospital, because, you know, if that family kept bringing her in and they were just letting the family interpret for her every single time that it was never identified what was going on so yeah certainly in that crafty, we know that you know a lot of these individuals are are exploited because they don't speak the language uh you know and in, in, in one of the statistics you know clearly is that like you know 67 percent of labor trafficking victims are hispanic and uh you know as we start to see an influx of, of smuggling and trafficking across the border and those individuals who might be coming into the United States that we don't know or even hear, uh, those are even more so easily exploited. And, and for them not to know the resources that might be available to them, uh, the services that might be available to them, uh, certainly that language barrier can, can definitely be a tool to, to exploit them. So when we talk about signs and indicators, just some of the red flags, you just keep in mind, you know, they're lured to the U.S. with false promises. Uh, this next story that I'm going to talk about, I'll just talk about it right here uh, and just skip that slide. But so this individual was recruited from Nicaragua into the United States from a, a person who was a uh, con who worked construction, had his own construction company here in the U.S. And he was also from Nicaragua, but he was, uh, you know, in, he was a permanent citizen here in the U.S., uh, he went home, he recruited him and a few other people to come uh, to the U.S. to work uh, as laborers, uh, told them they'd make really good money, uh, that once they got here, uh, that they could make a better life for themselves, send money back to their family, then later bring their family up. Uh, they bring them here to the U.S. and he puts them all in the uh, same house uh, and transports them to and from work. So they're dependent upon them to go from the home to work and then from work back to the home at the house. Uh, he did pay them, by the way. Um, so remember at the beginning, we talked about just because they're paid doesn't mean they're not being trafficked. Um, he charged them weekly for rent, charged them $200 a week for rent, 
Uh, then he charged them $30 a week to use the washer, $30 a week to use the dryer, $25 a week to use the um, refrigerator, $15 to use a plug-in for their phone. So charged them to use transportation to and from work. So as you can see, all these costs add up. So you might be getting a paycheck, but at the end of the week, you don't really have anything left because you basically became an indentured servant. And he also had to pay off the debt bondage that it cost for this person to bring him here to the US. And uh, the individual was working 16 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, and had actually cut his thumb off in the process because he literally fell asleep as he was laying a hardwood floor and the saw just took his uh, large thumb off and the trafficker actually took him in, uh, to the hospital and dumped him off. Um, as we worked the case, he was scared to uh, testify against the trafficker uh, even after we explained the, the, the laws that were in place to protect him because the trafficker threatened to kill his family back in Nicaragua. And he explained to us, you can protect me here, but you can't do anything for my family that's back there. So when we talk about the force, fraud, and coercion, we talk about the intimidation, we talk about these uh, things that the traffickers use. So signs of being controlled, fearful of police and authorities. In a lot of countries, law enforcement is not uh, has a reputation that they're fearful of the traffickers. Uh, you know, like Kelly had talked about earlier, the signs of untreated injuries. Uh, uh, you know, someone's not on mute, Rich. I don't know. If everyone could just mute. I can't. I don't know why I can't do it. I'm trying to see if I can meet people. Oh, I think it's good now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. So when we when we look at all of these factors, you know, we need to take into account that like, you know, it's not one of these factors that means somebody's being trafficked. But as we start adding these up and they become aggravated, agitated, they keep going up. And as we aggregate them out, we know that a multiple of those raises the risk that these individuals are being trafficked. So keep those in mind as, as, as you recognize this. And I always tell people, like, people often say, well, I don't want to say anything because I could be wrong. And I always say, well, I'd rather you say something and be wrong than not say something and had been right. Because that's just another day, another week, another month, another year that that person has to live in a trafficking situation. And you may be the only person that recognizes those signs for the next time that they're out in public, which could be who knows how long. So, and this is the story I was going to tell you guys. So, identification of victims, Kelly. Yeah. So, you know, service providers and law enforcement often don't initially recognize when a person is being trafficked. As, you know, Rich mentioned that even in court, sometimes it's a hard um, part to explain and what that means. And um, it's part of why these trainings are so important. Uh, the identification of human trafficking, as Rich mentioned, also that's very clandestine in nature. So the victim, you know, they move them frequently, could be underground, invisible. You, you really, um, they're not out in pub public view, you know, so, and they do that on purpose to prevent any kind of detection. Uh, and again, awareness and recognition of populations that are vulnerable. Um, as Rich mentioned earlier, runaways, that is a huge population that is at risk for human trafficking. So as we understand these vulnerabilities, that will really help all of our understanding of being able to identify these victims. So some barriers to identifying victims are, you know, basically you have to think about this. There's lack of information about um, these victims and the victims themselves are not gonna self-identify. Uh, that's a huge myth that they would just come forward and tell you. And that last story I think is a great example of one of the reasons why there's other reasons as well. Um, but the victims might be threatened themselves um, or coerced by their traffickers to be silent. So they don't seek help. So it could be that they're using psychological control tactics, intimidation, threats of continued abuse. So it might be for that person or for their family. Um, foreign born victims have a distrust for law enforcement, may fear deportation. Um, some may fear incarceration for the crimes that they committed while they were being trafficked. Um, and, you know, some victims have perceived, you know, been perceived or mislabeled as prostitutes. Uh, I always like to say that when I've shared with my dad different things, we were talking one day and uh, we were discussing human trafficking and what a big industry it is. And he was like, I don't understand how there's this many people. And one of the things that I think we have to re 
you know, shift our minds of what we think of prostitution. And just like we explained before, if they're under 18, they, they can't have a choice to do that anyway. But are they doing that by choice or are they being forced to? Um, so that's where we really have to look at that. So a little bit more to dive into these barriers a bit. Um, you know, the distrust in law enforcement you know, some of this could be that they're brainwashed or fear law enforcement by the pimp, or they just have that due to previous negative experiences. Uh, they're isolated from others. And, you know, it's amazing how quick, if you start to look into some of the psychological aspects of this, of any kind of abuse, really how quickly people can feel isolated and feel that they have nowhere to turn with this. Um, there's misinformation and false promises. So they've been told many lies. Some of them may even have a, you know, an attachment to their trafficker and almost feel safe with them. Because as we mentioned, when you think of the vulnerabilities that come along with this, they may feel like that's the only home they've had or the, they feel like they're taken care of, even if they're abused and, um, you know, trafficked, they're, they're, you know, they feel safe, they're getting food, they're getting some of their basic needs met. Um, hopelessness, resignation, just feelings of no self-worth, dissociation, just not even being present, part of even the looking away, uh, giving up, apathy, lack of knowledge of social systems. They may not understand social services or what is there to help them. They might blame themselves either because of the pimp or because maybe they, um, we're going to talk in a minute, I think it's like 55%, though, I'll tell you in a moment, of um, I think it's sex trafficking in particular met their perpetrators online. So they may have some self-blame for some of those things that they, you know, blame themselves for responding or meeting up with someone doing something. Maybe they think, you know, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, dependency on the pimp, again, for whether that's drugs, for food, for whatever that may be. Debt bondage, Rich mentioned that, that they have to maybe pay off a debt. Loyalty, again, that's Stockholm syndrome. That's what I was just basically talking about. Um, so, you know, it's very similar to battered women syndrome. Social barriers, unfamiliarity with surroundings due to frequent movement. They might not know where they are or how to get help. Uh, no identification with them or documentation because often that is controlled by the trafficker. trafficker. So we talk about force, fraud, and coercion. And, you know, so we've kind of broken this down a little bit so everybody kind of knows the, you know, those, those things that kind of fall under that. So when we say what are what are the tools that traffickers use and, and what's part of the statute that we use to prosecute them, um, the elements of force, fraud, and coercion, and we don't need all three. We just need one of the three, right? But the trafficker can typically use all three or, or one of the three. Force, physical violence, okay? Physical assault, rape, confinement, starvation, substance abuse, uh, you know, restraint. You know, one of the trafficking victims that uh, we had rescued, she had met her trafficker online. Um, and, and Kelly was right, 55% of trafficking victims have met um, their um, trafficker online uh, prior to meeting them in person. And uh, she met him online and he paid for her to travel down from uh, um, uh, Detroit, Michigan, down to Birmingham, Alabama. And when she did, she got down to Birmingham and met him. Uh, they hung out for a few days, uh, partied, had a good time, and then he um, forced her to use heroin. And she says, I'm a recovering heroin addict. And he says, oh, well, you know, you're going to use heroin. Uh, so he tricked her into using heroin again. She used the heroin, uh, quickly got her addicted again within a couple of days and then forced her into prostitution. And she woke up the next day and said, I'm not going to do this. I can't do this. I won't do this anymore. I'm going to leave. And he put a gun on the table and he said, you will do it again and you'll do it as many times as I tell you and you're not going anywhere and he beat her and he tied her up and left her in the hotel room for two days without food or water or a restroom for two full days and he came back and said do you need me now and he used that as a way to physically control her but also psychologically control her so when we look at the force fraud and coercion we look at fraud a lot of times these traffickers will romance their victims. They'll meet their victims. Uh, the, they'll become the Romeo pimp to them. They'll tell them that they love them. They'll make false promises. They'll give them the opportunity for a better life, okay? And then lure them into this servitude, whether it's sexual or, 
or domestic or, or through labor or coercion, psychological intimidation. Uh, and psychological intimidation can be through threats of violence uh, you know, against themselves or their loved ones. If you leave, I'll go kill your parents or I'll go kill your family or your friends. So when we talk about the forced fraud and coercion, there's many different aspects to this. So what are some of the red flags that we look for uh, when we look at uh, trafficking? You know, spotting the signs, some, some key indicators, fearful or depressed. Now, uh, you know, these signs are, are taken, you know, uh, strictly from, from victims that, that we've interviewed, that we've talked in. Uh, empirical evidence that we've, we've gathered in regards to this. A lot of victims are submissive and tense, okay? They're fearful, right? We talked about that. They're fearful of their trafficker. They're fearful of the person that um, they are dependent upon now for food, shelter, and maybe chemical dependency, whether it's drugs. They're scared to speak. Uh, they're afraid to speak for what they might say because their behavior and everything has been controlled. Um, they'll have bizarre and hostile behavior. Uh, resistant to your care. If you, you know, many times we'll, we'll reach out to victims that we see on the street and we'll offer them, you know, hey, can we help you? Is there anything we can? No, 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 I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And they're constantly looking around to make sure nobody's looking for them. They're very, very resistant. And as I'd mentioned before, um, addiction issues. So very common for these traffickers to use drugs as a means to control them. So um, Kelly had brought up earlier when uh, in, in, in her conversation about a lot of times these, these victims um, are, are scared to exit, okay? A lot of times people will say, why don't you just leave, okay? Because they can't, okay? They're not in a position. They're not strong enough emotionally, physically uh, strong enough to leave. Um, so when we look at somebody who might be providing commercial sex acts, okay, um, that's a, an area that we wanna look at. That, like, are they providing that commercial sex acts willingly or somebody forcing them to do that? Um, if they're paid little or not paid at all, they work excessive long hours. Remember, it's $150 billion a year of business. So if they're not getting paid, the trafficker is going to work them long hours so that he can get the most out of them as he can. Owes a large debt, unable to pay it off, recruited through false promises. Um, traffickers like to isolate their trafficking victims. They're not letting them have social media accounts. They're not letting them communicate with family. They're not letting, letting them hang out with family and friends. So they limit their social interaction and who they can hang out with, what they can do. And all of us, you know, on here know people who, you know, or, you know, you may have kids, you know what a scripted or rehearsed response is. You know, I know, you know, I have two teenagers and I know when they're, you know, when everything's not copacetic or, or truthful because their response seems pretty scripted. And it's the same way when we look at trafficking victims and in the fact that the trafficker says, this is what you'll say. If you're asked this, you will respond this way and nothing more. So this is what you rehearse to say. And then we also look at the fact that some of them will have, you know, uh, bruises or, or marks on their body, much like domestic violence victims that can't be explained or have unreasonable explanations for them. I hit a door, I fell down the stairs, uh, you know, the door opened up on me, et cetera. Okay. And then a lot of them might have unusual tattoos or branding that may just not be, and I'm not saying everybody has tattoos, trafficking victim, that's not what I'm saying, but, but tattoos that may be uh, not indicative of what a normal person might have on them. Uh, you know, tattoos are often used um, in two ways uh, from a trafficker. Trafficker uses it as a means of branding their product. They use it as a means of branding that person. But they also instill that psychological uh, manipulative uh, way on the victim that the victim realizes they're like a piece of property. They now belong to that pimp. That's his brand. Okay. So now we'll, we're going to move in to talk a little bit about um, the live streaming uh, sexual exploitation, because I think we're starting to see a trend push pretty heavily towards online exploitation uh, and trafficking online. Uh, which is kind of scary because it's kind of extremely difficult, as everyone knows, to to police the uh, the internet. Yeah, yeah. And one thing too that I want to mention is when you're talking about working the long hours, I know something to me that was shocking was that when it particularly with sex trafficking, that the victims are sold twenty or thirty times a day. So. I don't know why when I, before I learned much about human trafficking and, and everything that I know now, I guess I assumed it was maybe a couple people a day or one a day and sort of think about that and the the impact of that and, 
you know, just why it's important to report these things and, and try to put an end to them. So just something to, to add to that, the long hours. Um, but so, yeah, as you mentioned, the, the online is a huge thing. Again, I bring up that um, if you have kids or no kids, um, this is so important. And, and Rich has a story later to share with you that I hope really hits everyone to really consider um, what we allow kids to do and uh, just to share this information with anyone that you can. But obviously with COVID, um, you know, kids really became more vulnerable um, both to labor and sex trafficking, um, but particularly this online exploitation. So kids were at home, they were on their phones, their computers, they had to be somewhat for school. So some of it was um, just that they were forced online, right, for, for uh, school and everything in boredom, they couldn't see their friends, so they were online. Um, but also, a lot of schools have returned, as we know, but the internet usage has not diminished. And tips to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, they basically said that uh, this doubled, these tips doubled during the pandemic. And 2020 was a record-breaking year with more than 21.7 million reports of sus suspected child exploitation. So that's just insane. Um, it, it, this is it, in the U.S. It's oh, really go ahead, Rich. No, I was going to say, it's really mind-boggling because, you know, I had to double-check that statistic because yeah. I'm, I was thinking to myself, 22 million reports? I mean, how, how that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's it's insane. It's just insane. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, over 1.5 billion students worldwide were impacted by school closure, so many were vulnerable. Um, and you know, they took advantage of youth spending more time online um, through sexual coercion and sextortion. Girls, again, are particularly vulnerable and accounted for 90% of those featured in online child abuse materials. So things being marketed and sent. And there's that statistic, 55% of sex trafficking victims in the U.S. reportedly met their traffickers online. And Rich tells a story about, were you at a high school, Rich, where you asked them about meeting people online was that at a high school you were at talking yeah, I, was actually, I was actually in a high school right outside of washington dc and there were roughly about 2500 students in the auditorium and i'd asked them how many people have ever spoken to somebody online that you'd never met before and everyone raised their hand and uh, i was like okay great and then i was like going so how many of you um actually met that person uh, in person that you didn't know uh before but met them online and well over half, almost 75% raised their hand. And I was like, wow. So 75% of the auditorium basically went and met with somebody that they didn't know that they just met online. Yeah. Mm. So I just, I, I don't know if that blew my mind too. And just thinking about like, you know, when you think of the movie Taken or things like that, like, yes, again, that can happen. Obviously be cautious with, kids and and that's important to pay attention to where they are and things like that but you see how this is easy for them it's easy for them to find these kids it's they're meeting up with them they're hanging out with them people they're the kids are choosing to do this so i just get passionate about this sorry um so some push factors so vulnerabilities are issues that push kids so now we talked about those push pull factors earlier so this is similar but specific to children so kids that have been a victim of physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, or emotional abuse, um, children from households where domestic violence and abuse has been a feature, children of parents with a high level of vulnerability, so addicted to drugs or alcohol, uh, mental illness, learning disabilities, uh, family breakdown, disrupted family life, problematic parenting, uh, insecurities in the kids, so if the child is insecure, uh, and children who have physical or learning impairments. And then some pool factors. So the grooming techniques that are used to gain a child's attention, admiration, or affection really often taps into their insecurities and that desire for acceptance, right? That's what kids want, especially when I think of those, you know, preteen, early teen years, that's what they want, right? They want to be accepted by their friends, by others. They want to be loved. They want that love and belonging. So some of that is, you know, they like being liked by someone older, um, liked enough that a stranger asked for their phone number, uh, meeting someone who thinks they're special on the internet and they maybe receive alcohol, drugs, money, or other gifts, uh, getting a buzz and excitement of risk-taking or behavior they shouldn't be doing, so from drugs or alcohol, being offered somewhere to stay 
where there are no rules or boundaries. So if they, you know, feel like they're, they could go have fun, uh, being taken along to adult entertainment venues, red light or gay cruising areas, uh, being given lifts, taken to new places, having adventures with a casual acquaintance. So those are all the pool factors. So one of the trends that we're certainly definitely starting to see is the, the a crime of opportunity driven by demand of, of sex offenders, but certainly online exploitation. Children online are starting to be trafficked without physically uh, being in control of, of the trafficker. So, uh, for example, this case right here involves a 14-year-old girl who was convinced to do a, a, a strip show online while her parents thought she was in her room doing uh, homework. And, and what had happened is the trafficker or this individual, uh, and you don't necessarily have to be concerned about the person in Russia or China or England or Spain or South America or even the person down the street. You have to be concerned about all of them because they all have easy access to the internet and they're all grooming these, these kids. And, and one of my interviews that, that I took place with, with a trafficker, I went and interviewed him in, in jail. And uh, when I was talking to him, um, he had told me, he goes, Rich, you know, hey, listen, you know, before COVID, you know, before the social media platforms kind of exploded, I would develop this chat and I would cut and paste it into these chat boxes and these forums. And I would look for, for vulnerable uh kids that were in there looking for the same uh, type thing that, you know, or I'd make it sound like I was looking for the same type thing they were. And I'd send it out to them and I may get maybe be, I'd hit a hundred of them and maybe get 20%, you know, respond back. During COVID, I had, was an upward of about 80%. They were just looking for something to reach on to. And so in this case right here, this individual uh, convinced the girl to send him photographs of her. And then he used those photographs to uh, sex extort her or exploit her and uh, forced her to perform a live sex act uh, in, a, uh, in a live stream and then sold seats to individuals around the globe to come watch this. So he literally virtually trafficked this girl online. Uh, one of the biggest problems with this is only 40% of these uh, cases ever make it to law enforcement because uh, families are either too embarrassed to report it to law enforcement or the girls don't report it to their parents or so much time has elapsed between it. Um, you know, statistically, they say it's an upward of two years before the girls or boys even tell their parents that this is actually going on. And, and this is a case study uh, of, of Alice, and this is as recent as December. So in December um, 21st, uh, we had gotten a, a phone uh, call on our hotline in regards to a, a mother had contacted us in regards to her daughter, um, who she suspected of being exploited online. And, you know, one of our things are our prevention. So whether it's exploitation or trafficking, you know, we still look at as it as a preventative me measure to keep a person from becoming trafficking. And she was like, I saw some suspicious uh, text messages on her phone. So I, I interviewed the mom and examined the, uh, the phone and, and looked through everything. And long story short, she had met this guy on Virtual Quest, which is a... Uh, uh, it is what it is. It's a virtual headset that you wear and you go into these rooms and you can play all these types of games with individuals from around the world. Uh, and she met a guy in there that she who said he was a 14 year old from the United Kingdom. She was from the U.S. And so for this whole time, for this past month and a half, she's talking to this guy who she thought was a 14 year old boy from the U.K. And it progressed from the virtual quest game to another virtual game, then to Snapchat, then to text messages, and then to phone calls. And that's when the mother had found out she had noticed some suspicious indicators. And she had looked at her phone and, and saw that there were, had been some explicit pictures had been exchanged. Um, as I reviewed the phone, it was a typical case of grooming. Uh, this individual was telling her, uh, you know, to delete their chat messages, to delete the photographs, uh, to don't talk to anybody about this, and only those two could understand what was going on, how he really felt for her, really cared for. Her. So as I went through and, and conducted the investigation, she actually wasn't talking to a 14-year-old uh, boy from the United Kingdom. She was actually talking to a 44-year-old man from the United States. And as I did the background on, on the mail after we identified who he was, he had done a 15-year prison sentence for kidnapping. Um, so lo and behold, Alice wasn't talking to a 14-year-old boy from the United Kingdom. She was talking to a person who was recently uh, um, let out of jail uh, for a kidnapping charge. Uh, and, and this is the reality. I mean, the mother had prior training. She knew what to look for, and she contacted us. But a month had gone by, and this girl was groomed relatively 
quickly uh, when you look at this because it went from the virtual quest through all the other social media platforms super fast. Uh, and, you know, she was extremely vulnerable because she actually told this guy where she lived. Uh, and so he knew where she was actually located at. So some of the things that when we look at these online grooming indicators, you know, uh, for children, you know, we want to we want to look for the signs of trauma or stress in these kids. Right. Other than the normal day to day stress that actually compounds everything in there, you know, unusual behavior or, or certainly secretive behavior. Right. You know, isolating themselves in their room or the bathroom uh, or rooms where they can get away so they can spend enormous amounts of time in isolation on their phones or on their social media apps, uh, you know, isolating themselves from their friends and family. So obviously that quick change in behavior and behavior that seems out of the norm of what they normally would do. And then they also become very hostile or non-communicative with their parents. So the baseline behavior has, has certainly changed. Right. And, and obviously, everyone should know that 101 uh, protecting our children online is a clear Internet history. No one should have a cleared Internet history. OK, unless you're doing something uh, suspicious. So, you know, think about that changes, obviously, in their body language, the eye contact. Maybe they're dressing a little bit different. Maybe they're wearing more makeup or maybe they're communicating with somebody who's a much older boyfriend or girlfriend. OK, or. Obviously, signs of drug or, or alcohol abuse or acting older than, than what they are. And certainly the Internet has propelled children or almost forced them to grow up certainly a lot quicker uh, than, than what I did during my age or and probably most of you did in your age uh, in regards to that. So why is why online recruitment? Um, it's made it so much easier for these traffickers because the accessibility of the Internet. It's a shotgun approach. It's like shooting fish in a barrel for them. They don't have to go out anywhere. They can sit at home. And, you know, 55%, the statistics are in their favor. The 55% of the people they meet online, they're end up going to meet them in person. Uh, the apps that they, that they use online are certainly allowing them uh, to, to evaporate communications or delete communications that they have. So the proof is out there. Uh, multiple means of communication across multiple platforms of the apps that are out there. Like I said, you know, they can cut and paste their grooming uh, into all of these chats and send it out. It's easy work for them, right? Uh, they're also allowed to control their victims because they can use this as a means of sextortion. They can use this as a means of, you know, if you don't do this, I'll send those pictures to someone. So sextortion, certainly. And, and some of the things that we want to be concerned about and look for clearly are some of the um, the apps that that might be out there that that children or, or young adults probably shouldn't have on their phones. And these are certain, and, you know, at least some of the apps that we know uh, for a fact that traffickers use as a means to groom and target individuals to become. Certainly, if you have a teenage kid and they're using a dating app like Plenty of Fish or Tinder or things like this, and obviously that's probably not a good idea. But some of the ones that we think are normal, like, you know, your, your Snapchat and your, your TikTok and things like this, you know, obviously those can also be because, you know, these traffickers go through and they look for these individuals who may appear to be insecure and they target them uh, with, you know, basically their, their, their grooming techniques in order to get uh, into them and get into their head and psychologically manipulate them. So Cheyenne and Megan, I was going to give you guys an opportunity to jump in here. Sure. So um, advocating opportunity is unique in the sense that we are actually a law firm that structures our advocates under the umbrella of the law firm. So our advocates are covered under attorney client privilege and we provide services to um, all genders, everyone, as long as you've had a trafficking situation, either uh, sometime in your past or currently, we provide pro bono legal services. And our advocates will provide social services to the extent that they're needed, um, or we will try to connect them with someone in the community that provides that service. Our offices in Ohio, operate a little differently than our office in Nashville. Nashville uh, exists with 
these organizations that are around and are already providing so many amazing services uh, like Hope for Justice. And what we really want to do in Nashville is gap fill. So we show up and we ask, you know, where, where are you needing us to step in? Um, what are you having the hardest time getting for the people that you're serving? And can we help with that? Um, and Roxy and Megan are on here too. If y'all have anything to add that I missed. No, I don't think so. Um, we, you know, I think, for example, some of the services um, that we provide in Ohio that I know Cheyenne um, and Roxy do for you know, some of the clients that we have currently, you know, it might be access to housing. It might be something like helping somebody fill out housing applications for assistance. It might be calling and negotiating with a landlord where somebody might have unpaid rent. Um, it might be preventing an eviction. It might be trying to find um, a landlord who understands that the person has evictions as a result of their trafficking. It might be um, helping people get rid of a criminal record, um, such as charges of prostitution uh, that are related to their trafficking as well. If we can either get it sealed um, or, or vacated. We also do uh, family law sometimes um, if we have capacity and chance, just one person. So there's only so many she can take, but we do work with other pro bono partners that are often able to take cases and help us. Um, we do all kinds of different things. Um, we do victims' rights representation. So if someone wants to prosecute their trafficker, uh, then we can help you know support them during that particular journey. So that might be um, you know supporting them and being there when they're being interviewed by law enforcement, um, working with prosecutors, you know AUSAs or, or local DAs, um, helping people who are part of some of the specialty courts like Cherished Hearts. Um, helping and just providing support um, for some of the other, you know, big places. I know Cheyenne has some, you know, shared clients with End Slavery and some other ones where, you know, we're providing legal services and just kind of as a backup to the services that they're already providing. Cheyenne, anything I'm forgetting? Um, I do. What we also focus a lot of on trauma and resilience. Um, we partner with uh, consulting company Finding Hope, and we put on trainings uh, that focus predominantly on providing not just trauma informed services, but trauma responsive services. And um, all of our advocates are trained, and um, we are looking forward to putting on a training in Nashville uh, sometime in the very near future that will directly talk about how we provide services in the framework of um, neuroscience and trauma, even though we're not licensed therapists, we still find ourselves um, coming up and needing those tools. Yes, and I did put in the chat, um, we do have a couple of trainings that we've put on live already, but we recorded that you can still register for, take for free um, and watch anytime. Um, they do have some uh, continuing legal hours if anybody's a lawyer. Um, usually you can, um, if it's accepted in one state, you can get credit in another sometimes. So there's one, an advanced training on trauma that's about 14 hours. And then there's some introductory uh, training on a labor trafficking project that we have. Both of those are going to be two or three year cohorts. So if you're in the field or interested in being part of that cohort, you would watch the foundational trainings and then you would get information on any of the upcoming trainings, which should be in person in Nashville as well. And then we'll do a hybrid, probably virtual. So for people who can't make it. Yeah, such great work you guys are doing because a lot of people don't realize that, you know, when a trafficking victim is rescued, uh, that's just an event. There's a process to actually making their life whole again. And the work that you guys are doing in, in order to do that uh, is amazing because a lot of people don't understand that sometimes these victims are actually forced into committing crimes or have been arrested during the course of their victimization. And uh, that's prohibiting them from moving forward in their life now that they have been, you know, rescued or put on the track to recovery. So for the for those of you who are interested in learning more about this, you can screenshot this on how to contact 
uh, um, advocating opportunity, um, or uh, you can have the email addresses of everybody who's on here tonight uh, for services. And Megan, I think you and I had talked earlier that even though you guys may not be operating in a state that somebody uh, on here may be, you have uh, tentacles that can stretch out to kind of refer them to another organization, right? Cheyenne and Megan, am I right with that? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So we're part of a group called Freedom Network that has, I think, 40 or 50 other um, places that provide services to human trafficking victims throughout the United States. Um, I'm also um, connected through the international law community. I'm also a professor of international law um, at our local law school. So I'm connected with a lot of lawyers internationally who often have connections to, to other groups. And I'm also connected to some of the international groups uh, for people who are looking for assistance. Um, usually we can find somebody that can provide help. So always definitely ask us and you know, if we can help, we'd love to. And if it can't be us, we'll try and get you to the right place. I think that's the important aspect is if people recognize the fact that somebody needs help, reach out to somebody. And then, you know, we as a network working together can refer you to the, the best possible group that can facilitate uh, the issue. So um, if you recognize somebody who might be a trafficking victim, obviously, if it's an imminent threat, call 911. Don't bother looking for anything else. Just contact 911. Um, if you suspect something that might be trafficking victims uh, or somebody engaged in trafficking activity, contact Homeland Security, uh, obviously local law enforcement in your area, federal law enforcement, uh, National Human Trafficking Hotline, you can contact Hope for Justice. We have a 24-7 hotline. Uh, we work hand in hand with law enforcement and other NGOs uh, to, to, to like, much like tonight in doing this. But the key to what we're doing is really uh, all of us working together to prevent exploitation. Uh, raise that level of awareness so that we can uh, identify victims, uh, rescue them, restore their lives, and kind of reform society so that uh, we can end this. Um, so at this time, I think we'll, we'll field questions uh, from anyone who might have uh, questions in regards to the presentation tonight uh, for anyone on here. Is it possible to get slides for coworkers? I see in the chat box. Yeah, absolutely. If you'll email me, uh, I will send you the link to this presentation uh, and I'll send you the information that you might need. And one thing just to add, I always like to add at the end because I know this is so heavy to hear, especially if this is your first exposure to human trafficking. I know for me, I wrestled with even wanting to be a part of hope for justice for a while because i just wanted to bury my head in the sand and ignore it because it it was hard and so i just want to encourage you that doing anything makes an impact even just sharing this with a coworker, sharing this with somebody in your life just forwarding on the training doing something like that can save a kid's life can save an adult's life um, and just being aware of this but also knowing that these a lot of these victims end up with amazing lives they they go through some of these services like you guys have, Cheyenne and Megan, and um, they get help and they go on to get married, have kids, have families, kids go on to laugh and play again. And it always chokes me up when I say that, but it's like you think of what they've experienced and it's so horrible, but yet they do go through healing and, and they get better. And that's why this matters because these people's lives matter and it matters to do something for them and help them because nobody deserves to be trapped in that. So I just want to say that and I, I'll leave it to any questions, but I'm just grateful for every one of you on here listening, or if you're listening to this recording, just to take this time to learn this, you, you never know, you may truly save someone's life. And that's amazing. <laughs> it's more than life or death, this type of life, I can't even imagine. So that's, and that's such a great point, Kelly, too. We, we track kind of our client success over, you know, over a year or so. We have, we serve all together between Nashville and our, our Ohio offices. We serve about 225 victims every year. Um, and about every year between 96 and 98% of them do leave their trafficking situation and are able to stay out. Um, so we're able, really have a lot of success with being able to stabilize people and then slowly move. And then we try to, sorry, my dog is really wants me to go downstairs right now. <laughs> She's like <laughs> whining and crying and shaking and like trying to get me to leave this particular spot. Sorry, sassafras is a little sassy. Um, but yeah, it really does make a difference. Um, we use a really uh, trauma, uh, trauma, it's called a trauma responsive care approach. And it has really specific interventions um, that people can use in the moment you know, with their clients. And it just, we've noticed that once people start working with that, they just kind of, they, they, 
like shoot off like a rocket. Like they just get better really quickly. And, you know, it's still sort of a process, but people's ability to kind of build resilience is really incredible and really amazing when they get people that believe in them standing behind them. So even if it feels like it's maybe you're not doing much, you know, you, you really are. It's it's worth it's worth investing in. Thanks, Megan. That's awesome. Oh, we did that. Yeah, we had a person that just graduated from Cornell Business School, um, which is amazing. Ivy League. She went from, you know, going to a, a school where she almost didn't graduate and then did a two plus two and graduated from Cornell Business. Now she's working for one of the large banks here doing finance. She loves it. It's her passion. Um, you know, we have somebody else who's a director of victim services for an organization in D.C. She has her master's degree. Another person getting her master's in counseling. I mean, it's just, you know, people are really, you know, people really are, are, are pretty successful. Okay, excellent. If no one else has any questions, that means that all of us must have answered all your questions during the course of the presentation. So, uh, so I want to thank everybody for joining uh, Hope for Justice and advocating opportunity tonight uh, for this uh, session on, on human trafficking awareness. I hope everybody can take away a little bit out of this uh, and, and, and go out and talk to your coworkers, your family, your friends, uh, you know, and disprove the myths that, that most people think that surround human trafficking and, and, uh, engage them and encourage them to attend an awareness training, whether, uh, one of us puts it on or somebody else puts it on. There's a lot of great NGOs out there spreading the message. And if we all grabbed each other, each other's hands and walked across the U S we couldn't eradicate, uh, human trafficking. So, but, uh, you know, let's educate as many people as we can. Uh, so thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Stay safe. And I put my email in the chat box. If you'd like a copy of the recording, I'm happy to send it to you. Uh, if you'd like a copy of the outline, the training outline, happy to do that. If you'd like for us to, to, uh, to extend this training to any of the organizations you might belong to, we're happy to do that as well. So everyone have a great night and thanks again for joining. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. We're really looking forward to working with you, you all. Yes. Thank you, guys. Thanks.